What's up, guys? We are back with another episode of Pound for Pound. I am the Nigerian Nightmare, Kamaru Usman. Henry Cejudo, a.k.a. Triple C. And guys, today we have a very, very special guest, a man that needs no introduction, but we're going to give him one anyways. Uh, three time. I know he might not, you know, some of you might not even want to say, ah, oh, three time because one was the interim, but three time super middleweight champion of the world and one of the most talked about fighters right now. Not to mention the youngest champion, super middleweight champion, Mr. David Benavidez. Thank you guys, I appreciate that. And, uh, and it feels good to be here with you guys. A Shot of Lime production. My guy. Yo, I'm, obviously we've been watching you for a while now. You know, we've seen all the body of work that you've put in. And you're kind of, you're kind of the talk of the, uh, of the boxing world right now. You know, obviously there's, there's the little guys, but they've always been this little guys, you know, historically, you know, they do well. And then you've got the big guys and then you've got the guys that can transition. And you are kind of one of those guys that can transition because you're like, besides Canelo, you are the guy that everyone's talking about right now with your style, the way that you finish fights, the way that you come to fight each and every time. It's never a boring fight. I mean, David, the body of work that you've put in has got you to that place now, but you're you're still chasing something. You're chasing something. Yeah. No, yeah. So right now I'm basically chasing all four titles. You know, it's a right that I've, you know, respectfully earned. And um, I've been, you know, I've just been putting in a lot of work for a long, long time, bro. I'm 27 years old now. I have 10 years professional. You know what I mean? So I've just been putting in work. I've been beating the people who they needed me to beat. Um, you know, and I've been doing everything in my power to get to that fight. But, you know, unfortunately that fight isn't happening. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, that's kind of one of the things and kind of like the knock on boxing, which is the difference between what we do in the, in the UFC and in the, what the, in the boxing has become is obviously there's the four titles, which, you know, for those of you who don't understand, obviously there's the WBC, there's the IBF, there's the WBA and, um, IBO, IB, IBO, yes, it's IBO, right? IBO, WBO, 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 WBO. and it's, you know, guys can have a piece of, of, of the title in that weight class and then just kind of hang on to that belt and not want to unify. So it makes it very, very difficult to determine who is the best in the world, who is the best super middleweight in the world when four guys have titles and they're considered world champions. Yeah, because it's almost like this, like the belt area, the belt era of the four belts came like in the middle of the 80s, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because yeah, that's where you had Hearns and you had, uh, uh, you know, Sugar Ray Leonard and everybody had about the four horsemen. Yeah. Like, how do, how do you, how, where do you think that that changes everything? Because, you know, I, I know you're, he's a, he's a big UFC guy. This dude is, uh, he loves the sport of mixed martial arts. Yeah. Even, even before it went mainstream, I remember training with him and his brother. Like, they would always watch, like, WEC, uh, UFC. But how now, David, especially and particularly in your position, the fact that, you know, let's, let's 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 call the pink elephant in the room. Canelo, he doesn't want to fight you. Yeah, bro, it's, it's a little hard, you know, just to because obviously this is a fight that everybody wants to see. It's the biggest fight in boxing, in my opinion, right now. But it sucks when a guy, as Canelo says, that he's the king, he can do whatever he wants. He's basically holding the belts hostage. You king, know what I mean? yeah, of course, king or prima donna. Yeah, basically, you know what I mean. And um, like I said, I just I did everything in my power to make this fight happen. You know, I won the interim title, I won title eliminators, and I beat the guys who they told me that I couldn't beat. So I'm, I feel like I'm in line for this fight, but the only reason that he doesn't want to fight me because he knows that it's going to be a passing of a torch. It's not going to be him with his victory in his hand race. It's going to be him passing mm. all the, the torches to me. That's that's very interesting that you say that because we had a, we had a conversation early on this year mm. um, with a, uh, a former boxer obviously multiple time world champion and and this subject came up is okay he's talking about oscar historically <laughs> i'm talking about speaking of oscar <laughs> Dillon, but historically and, and i think this is something that that people are so attracted to in the sports world is historically there is this thing that whether we like it or not whether we know it or not and it, it's called the passing of the guard and the passing of the guard doesn't necessarily means okay, the new guy comes in and just beats the dog shit out of the, the old guy and the old guy's done. The passing of the torch is, you know, there's been a guy that has been put in that position to where rightfully he has earned it and he's been the top guy and he's done his job in that, in that spot. But then it comes because time waits for no one. 
you know, it comes a time where it's the new guy steps up that says, I am the new guy to carry that torch forward. And they step in and then you have to kind of hand, hand that over. We saw that if we want to talk about the Mexican boxing, we saw that with Julio Cesar Chavez and Oscar De La Hoya, you know. And even with that, Oscar did do a favor because Mayweather was at a point where Mayweather was, yes, he's not Mexican, but Mayweather was at that place where he was his own brand now. He was trying to build himself, but he needed that Oscar De La Hoya fight. He got it, and Mayweather became Mayweather. Yeah. And in turn, whether we like to believe it or not, Mayweather gave that to Canelo. Yeah. He didn't have to fight Canelo, but he did that. And yes, Canelo didn't get the win. So what I'm saying is, yes, that passing of the guard doesn't necessarily mean you have to get that win, but that gives you the stamp of I'm the new guy who's going to take boxing forward. And I kind of feel like we're in a place now where there's the new guy saying, hey, I'm here. Look at me. Give me that opportunity. And do you feel like that's something that's, that's, that's not happening? Yeah, I definitely do feel like that. I feel like in every sport, there's always going to be, you know, a new contender, a new hungry contender that a lot of people gravitate towards to. Also kind of like how when you beat Tyrone Woodley, you know what I mean? Because you were the guy coming up and Tyrone Woodley was a dominant champion for a long time and you went and you beat the shit out of him. So I feel like with me, it's, it's the same thing. You know, I mean, I'm preparing, I'm preparing very hard for this fight whenever it does happen. I don't know when it's going to happen, but, you know, I stay training. I stay evolving as a fighter. And I just want to give the fans, not only do I want to prove to the fans, but I want to prove to myself that I'm the best in the world. So if the fight comes, you know, good. If it doesn't, you know, it's, it's not the end of my career. I'm going to still keep paving my way, working my way. And if he doesn't want to give me the opportunity on 168, that's why I'm going up to 175 right now. Because I'm not going to wait for nobody either. You know what I mean? I know my dreams. I know what I'm set out to do. And I know what I'm capable of doing. So this is why, you know, I said, if it's not going to happen at 68, I'm going to go up to 75. This fight's going to put me at the number one contender to fight for the WBC title. And those are going to get unified on 175. So, you know, like I said, dreams always come true. It doesn't matter if somebody else is trying to stop you. You're going to find your own way. And you're going to make your dreams come true regardless. Yeah. You know, that's, that's partially what I love about you. David, especially you as a fighter, you like you take on all comers. But if the fight with Canelo doesn't happen, you're looking to go up to 175 pounds and potentially get the winner out of Bedarev and Bivol. Yeah. Which, if we all know the sport of boxing, Bivol is the one that you know decisively beat a guy like Canelo. Yeah. And I know talking to a lot of people, you have sparred with uh, with uh, with Bivol, and you you sparred with. Uh, I'm not sure if you sparred with Bedarev. No, I haven't sparred with him, but I sparred with Bivol. Bivo, and was, you were younger. I was 22. Yeah, so I mean, I, I from seeing what I did to him in those sparring sessions, I'm very confident I would win. But I'm not gonna, you know, be a fool and just use confidence as the 100 percent fuel. You know, I'm gonna go in there and work extremely hard, and that's why I want to be a part of these big fights too. Because as you know, both you guys know, once you get a good, like a really good fight in front of you, the training camp is different, the mentality is different, and when you get in that ring, you shine. And I, that's what I want for myself. I want to be put in them hard positions. I want to be put in, you know where you have to use 100% of your skills. And that's why I feel like the best will come out of me. So I'm not scared of it. So whatever it is, even if, you know, not uh, light heavyweight isn't my final destination, I really want to go up to cruiserweight, you know, by the time my career is done. And cruiserweight is what weight? Um, I think it's 200. Oof, so that's cruiserweight, just another... It's, yeah. So you're, you're a weight class away from going to actual heavyweight. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, we're going to move one step at a time. We got light heavyweight. And that's a, that's a division I've been wanting to go to for a long, long time. I mean, I, I did my 30-day weigh-in um, yesterday. I only have 13 pounds left to lose. So, I mean, so I, I feel great. And, um, you have 13 pounds left to lose to yeah. make light heavyweight. Light heavyweight. One, which is 170, 175. 175. Yeah, so I'm, I'm like a month away. Sheesh. So I feel good. I've never felt this good. You know, a month of, oh, I felt good, but like in weight terms. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm just ready to take on this, uh, this uh, challenge. You could, so you can, you can easily get okay we have to ask <laughs> how what do you walk around when you're not i walk around like 200 200 200 tamale season tamale <laughs> season <laughs> burger season, <laughs> season lobster, it's everything yeah. season everything <laughs> season okay I hear, I hear you man like when you see a guy like canelo and you're thinking okay why doesn't canelo want want to fight me what makes you problematic and what brings I'm going to say, what brings that fear into this guy? Whether you guys want to call it the passing of the torch or the passing of the guard, what is it that makes Canelo not want to fight the Mexican monster? I think it's just the way, 
I fight all my every single fight. I fight, I don't fight for to get to twelve rounds. I fight to knock everybody out. You know, to implement as much damage as possible. And there's just a variety of stuff I could do. You know, I can fight on the inside. I can fight on the outside. I'm very fast. I'm very powerful. I like to throw combinations. And if and jab also jabs my favorite body. That's what I'm saying. I could do a lot of stuff. And if you really see the people that Canelo has trouble with, are the people that throw a lot of combinations. And that's my specialty. You know what I mean? And um. I just want it. I feel like he knows it. He knows that how hungry I am for this fight. As much as he tries to say that I'm not, I'm this, I'm that, but he knows that I'm on his ass, and he knows that once we get in that fight, this is gonna be the hardest fight he's ever been through. Okay, so I I watched your, I've seen your fight when you fought uh, Ronald, uh, his last name always Ellis, with, which uh, gave you the the title, mm -hmm. I believe, and you know an impressive fight because that fight was a, it was a back and forth, a tough fight. Yeah. It, it looked tough. I that mean, guy even was though actually, he was actually from Canelo's camp, his main really? sparring partner. Yeah, yeah, it, it looked so tough. He, even so though he probably it looked sent like, Canelo a message, but yeah. like, hey, don't fight. Even though it looked like, <laughs> even though it looked like you were you were having fun in the fight. Yeah, you know it. It, it but you just you kind of started pouring it on and pouring it on, and clearly from that fight, we could tell that it, it was he was he's a great boxer, and he did a great job of boxing and mixing it up. But for you, it was just every time you would land a shot, it just seemed like the shots were more effective in the fight. Yeah. And obviously, we got the the lopsided score. You know, one judge gave it to him, you know, 116, I think 111 or 112, something like that. But you ultimately pulled away from that. But looking at that fight and looking at the, the fighter that you were then compared to the fighter that you are now. Well, you're, you're talking about Ronald Ellis. Yeah. I mean, no, Ronald, no, no. Ronald Govell. Govell. Ronald Govell, Correct. yeah. Yes. So I could I could tell you the whole thing about this story. This, this So this fight, how it happened, it was my first title fight. I was 20 years old. So I went through a lot that fight. I think three weeks before my uncle had died. Really? You know what I mean? So it was my, my mother's brother. So I was very close to him. That really fucked me up. You know what I mean? And then having to fight three weeks after that, you know, this is a person I love dearly. And that was the first time I've ever gone through with like a relative dying like that. So it was very hard for me. But take nothing away from it. Ronald Ellis, he went. I mean, Ronald, Ronald Gravel, he went and showed up. He fought a great fight. But I feel like we pulled, you know, from what I was going through in that fight. You know, and that I was, also got sick the week of the fight. I did the best I could, and I got the, the victory. When we did the rematch, I don't know if you've seen the rematch. It was a completely different fight. It was, a, yeah, the rematch. Because it was a close fight. You know, I give it to him. He did really good. He won some rounds. So I said, I agreed to rematch in the back room. I'm like, we got to do it again. That fight, I won every single round. I think I only lost one round. But if you could go back and look at that one, that one's really good. But what's changed for me, too, is just evolving as a fighter. You know, I think you know as well, like, just because you win a fight, you know what I mean? It doesn't mean that you have to stay in the same, learn the same thing you're doing. You, have, you evolve as a fighter because the fighters evolve as well. You're not going to get the same fighting style every single time. You're going to get something different. People are going to do different. People are going to catch up to the stuff you're doing. And you have to do different stuff. So it's just also me just being the best version of myself I could be, you know, and then just, you know, just being comfortable where I'm at. You know, uh, that fight, I was 20 years old. Now I'm 27. I've been professional 10 years. You know, I've been through some hard fights, been through some easy fights. But I use all of that as fuel as, uh, and all as experience, you know, as to where I'm going and how much better I could possibly get. Yeah. Watch, watching that Canelo uh, Munguia fight. And if you notice those first couple of rounds, like Munguia, he it seems like he had the right game plan, yeah. pressing them, using his straight punches. Like I, I sometimes wonder, even in those first couple of rounds. But then what happened with Munguia is he kind of went astray from the game plan. He went back to that Mexican style. Yeah, you know what discipline do you need to have to fight a guy like Canelo in order for you to actually be like you at the age of twenty seven. You, you, you have the ability, obviously, and the, the experience to be able to fight this dude where you're maybe make may, maybe make him backpedal. Yeah. Exactly how is it that uh, that better rev did to did to Canelo? It's pretty much, all right, man, I'm not going to react to your punches. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, Bivol. I'm going to get you kind of somewhat going backwards. And uh, and I, I, me watching the fight, I'm just thinking like, all right, man, how is it that David would actually fight him? So if you, if you look at the bigger guys, the bigger guys that Canelo's fought with power, you could tell that... He doesn't seem like a 68-pounder dude. He doesn't... He gets pushed back by them. You know what I mean? He gets the... the he doesn't really take the shots well like as when, when he took the shots against Billy Joe Sanders and Caleb Plant. 
So he's he's vulnerable for them shots. And then when when Munguil was throwing more combinations, you could kind of see Canelo coming back. You know what I mean? Getting pushed back. I feel like Canelo. He's too smart of a fighter. You just try to one-shot him. You have to throw combinations and combinations and keep him on the end of the jab and also use the ring. When Munguia messed up at, he stopped using that game plan and he'd he, he just inside, started pressing more. That's when he would get caught with the body shots and the uppercuts. So, and the thing about Munguia too, his defense is not that good. Yeah. So that kind of didn't do him no good either. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so he went from his gift from using his length to eventually kind of fight an inside. Why would, gets, the, why would the taller man fight an inside? Yeah, it doesn't you know make any mean? sense. It doesn't make any sense, especially when he was having success throwing yeah. his combinations yeah. and his jab. He should at just the, stay at with At the that. talent of his jab or his right hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Canelo's not that big, dude. You're 6'1", yeah. he's 5'8". Yeah, he's small. Yeah, yeah he's, he's a small 68-pounder. Yeah. I mean... He, he, I, and I, I agree, he, he's a smaller in stature. The one thing about him, though, when he does get inside the ring, he's big. Mm -hmm. He's big. The way he he corners guys, the way he kind of breaks guys down over time, he's big. Yeah. Actually watching and studying him. But this is one, and I've been hearing this a lot. You know, I, I don't, I absolutely don't believe Canelo is scared. And I, I think you understand that as well. You know that. But there's I, something. I, I disagree, but go there's, ahead. There's something. Because you can't be, you're not scared to be a world champion. It's, it's, I don't care if it's someone that's extremely, you know, that might be dangerous to you. But that's what we do. That's what you do. That's what you taking all these shit. You sparring with these guys since you were young. You weren't. Of course, you, you, you know, you might be a little worried on the inside. But you step in there and you spar with these guys anyways. And then you get done. You're like, oh, I didn't die. Yeah. You know, I'm good. So yeah. I, I don't I don't I don't believe that rhetoric. Oh, a Canelo scared. But. If I'm I understand Canelo's position, if I'm in his shoes Towards the tail end of his career. 200 million, Kamaru. 200 million. Oh, go that, ahead. Go ahead. Like that. Towards the tail end of his career. And I have a piece of paper in front of me with names on there yeah. of uh, which guy should I, should I pick to fight? I've got Terrence Crawford, Mungia, Caleb Plant again. Let's say Jer Jamal Char uh, 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 Charlo. David Benavidez. I'm looking at all these names. Uh, who do I pick? I'm going to look this away. One, I'm going to look away. This one, 20 million. 25 million. Maybe 30 million. 35 million. 150? <laughs> 200 million? But I'm at the tail end. Your name is not exactly jumping off. And, and especially a guy like Canelo. It's not that he needs money. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to say he doesn't need money. We all need money. I don't care how much money you got. We need money. You know. But if I had to pick, your name is not the first pick. Yeah. Because you you possess the, you pose the most problems. Yeah. So I understand that from his perspective, being at the tail end of his career, do I want to fight this guy? But what I don't, what I, I, I don't understand and what I have a hard time with is him understanding that he is that path for you becoming the next face yeah. boss. Yeah, but, but, but hold on. And before, not before, giving you, before you, you answer that, David? That and not giving you that opportunity. Yeah. That I don't like and I and I don't understand. Yeah. Because yeah. if he does if he does believe he's still the top, the king of boxing, then of course I yeah. would go ahead and silence no, of all course, the Of course, Kamaru, but the, the, big, the biggest thing though that I'm going to say is under the WBC, he is the mandatory. So where is it that the sport still becomes fair and becomes clean? Like, oh, you know we, what I'm we've, saying? We've, like, okay, we all, like, we've already known that. At the end of the day, people are vacating vacating titles so they don't have to fight certain it, people. Yeah, but if that's the I case, understand then, that. then if that's the case, then if he, but, can't, if he cannot find the mandatory, then vacate the belt. Simple. So to be honest with you, I, I agree 100% to what you're saying. And I've said that in interviews before. I feel like he's getting the easiest fights first, setting up his retirement plan yeah. with me. But... Like I said, if <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying, uh, if you let somebody pick the easiest fights possible, then that that's if they're making that much money, they're gonna do that. It's not his job; it's the WBC's job. True. So that's what kind of pisses me off too. And then I had heard some stuff where the WBC said that, oh well, they were trying to make the fight, and he decided to go up to one seventy-five. Bro, I was here. I was literally here in this apartment waiting for three, four months. To get a call, like, hey, you know what I mean? I was getting ready the whole time. And I didn't hear nothing. I said, all right, well, let me see. I'm not going to be at 168 no more. 
Let me go up to 175. I thought that that would be cool since I'd been the number one contender for three years. I thought I was going to be able to go up, uh, come back down. But then I didn't like what I heard saying, oh, they're saying, the WB saying that David has 10 days to decide whether he's going to stay at 175 or come back to 168. So it's like, come on, dude. Like, I've been saying, I don't know, I'm not saying, I've been fighting, winning the fights. I'm not really even complaining to you guys like that. But if you guys put this 10-day time period on me, like, what the fuck? Like, you guys think I'm not going to say nothing? Like, that's kind of disrespectful to me. To be honest with you, I mean, I've been number one contender for three years. People have been wanting to see this fight. You guys gave the opportunity, the WBC, to Jaime Munguia first. Now I think Berlanga might get the, you know, his number. He's a yeah. contender to fight. So it's a, it's well, a whole Ber- bunch of crazy shit happening. What's bro. what's what's uh what's Berlanga's what's his ranking? I don't know, but I Is guess they're making him even... mandatory. You know, I mean, I don't want to talk bad about him. I know he's doing the best he could do. He's 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 training hard. He's a good fighter. But, like, I've been there for a long time, bro. And I've been being yeah. the people they told me to beat. I, but, like I said, if if I'm not going to get this opportunity here, bro, I'm going to go look no, somewhere else. No, no, of else. course. And, and I feel like you going up to 175 pounds, you fight a guy like Bivar, and you beat him. You know how bad some make Canelo yeah. look? And that's on top of you conquering another thing. And then not just that. David isn't finished there. The dude's going down and fighting a freaking well to yeah. a 147 pounder, and he wants to put a clause on you. You cannot be 20 or 30 pounds heavier yeah. when you go into yeah. the room. Like, how much bullshit is yeah. that? So, like, like if you ask me, which which I'm, I I I disagree with Kamara. Yeah, I think he's scared. Yeah, I straight up. I but, don't, but one don't. thing I do want to say first though, the vision I have for myself is I'm gonna win this fight. Then I'm going to fight for the unified titles at 175. And then maybe we could get a catch weight, 173, with me and Canelo. Winner takes all. 75 pound belts and 68 pound belts. You could do that. Do you think. Shit, why not? You, <laughs> why not? Okay, so. You could be a Do you think you could make 60 or well, 68? Yeah. You could make that. Yeah. So. No, I. I but no, first but of all, I want to hear what he said. Did you hear what he said? I hear what you said, but which at the end of the day is now. You know, for the WBC to go, okay, yeah, you can hand our belt away at that weight class, even if you don't make the weight. You know, it, it just goes to show. I mean, first of all, we already know they're picking and choosing yeah. because for Canelo to be able to to do this, uh, play this this game, that's them. Yeah. Because as we know, the 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 the, national, the governing body, they they like who they like. They like their stars. Okay, this is our face. This is what we want. So they kind of they kind of angle to that person and they play that. They also get percentage as well. Which That's is a big part. <laughs> which is which which is what sucks. Yeah, it's yeah. huge about it because everybody wanna keep they want to keep their cash cow. Yeah. But I think you're on the right track. I think you're doing everything that you need to do because I think you've you fought who you need to fight. There's besides at 168, who else is left? You fought Caleb Plan. You fought uh um uh, you beat Anthony Durrell. Yeah. You know, you fought Andrade. everyone on Andrade. 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 Andrade, Demetrius Andrade. You fought everybody. That they needed to be yeah, there, yeah. except the one guy. Yeah. And if he's not willing to fight you, and if you're willing to say, you know what, I'm not sticking around here. Yeah. I'm gonna move up. And this is the one thing about what we do as fighters. The world recognizes it. Yeah. yeah. They see who's fighting. They see who is willing to take those chances, yeah. and they know who is gonna be the face. Yeah. So it doesn't matter whether he fights you or not, whether he says yes or no. If he's willing to go out like that, knowing that he didn't fight them. Yeah, you don't think Mayweather boxing Pacquiao. fans know that? They know that. Yeah, and and I think you, I think you're doing the the, the right thing. You go up and you beat it's like Henry that, mentioned. It's just that payday. You go up and you beat uh, Bivol. I mean, the world looks at you and they go, "Okay, now I see what yeah. you're saying." Yeah, but but and, but, and but that would make our fight a hundred times bigger. Right, times exactly. Bigger. But how how frustrating, or even you, you can even go to the point where it's like, yeah, how frustrating or irritating it is that. He's willing to give a guy who is 20 pounds lighter than him an opportunity. And what the people really want, because if you didn't know this, Kamaru, Canelo's last fight with Munguia, he sold 520,000 pay-per-views. You know, and Mexicans, for the most part, when Mexicans fight Mexicans, it sells. But you know who they really wanted to see? You know that would really triple that number where I believe that I could get interviewed? I, I, I believe that I can potentially, you know, be one of the top selling fights. I, I think you guys can do 2.2 million sales if you fight if you fight Canelo. You know what the whole prediction why is because we go back to Manny Pacquiao, Mayweather. But how frustrating 
is that for you? The fact that he's willing to give, and I love Terrence, yeah. and I think Terrence is right now for me. I, I feel like he is pop for pound. Yeah, you haven't had a chance to really prove that no. with somebody big like Canelo to be able to say that. But right now, the fact that he's choosing a guy who's twenty pounds lighter, like, yeah, like, 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 like where you at with that? So to be honest with you, it's, it's extremely frustrating. You know, I could tell you how much I'm frustrated. You guys understand me, but for the people who don't understand me, it's like. You're putting in work year after year, doing the best you possibly can in line for a promotion and you just never get the promotion. You know, you've been working hard. You know that everybody recognizes the work, but you're not getting the promotion. You know what I mean? That's kind of in the seat I'm in right now. But like I said, I, I, I still try to look, look at the negative as a positive. You know, the more he puts this fight off, the bigger this fight gets. The more experience I'm getting, the better I'm getting. He's getting older. I'm barely coming into my prime. You know what I mean? So it's just that I just gotta, I just that's, gotta stay that's focused. Well put. And that's he, what I'm saying. He just saw this that's well put. That's well put because that's 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 something that people in 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 the position don't necessarily think about. And that's what whether they, they can believe it or not, Mayweather was very intelligent with. Yeah, he understood that. You know, and and you would think Canelo would understand that now, and understand that maybe I should get this guy out of here mm -hmm. while he's young. I think he's I just so arrogant leave. that he thinks that that I'm not shit. You know what I mean? He, but he, he can't. I. I but he, this is the thing. He's. He, I don't think so. I don't think he can say you ain't shit because but he tries to say it in person. Well, yeah, but, and he course. knows to himself. But of course, he's going to as a because you know it as a, as an alpha as a, as a big dog as the face and when you you know you're gonna downplay every oh like yeah. that guy's not that good yeah. uh, he's not that good yeah. you know but secretly like Shh, yeah. that motherfucker might be you know <laughs> he might be that dude yeah. but at the same time you know for you you're doing everything that you need to do and so that's we recognize it just like we're here having this debate now everyone's at home having the same debate yeah because if you're you're not just beating these guys you're beating them and you're still making it kind of look flawless yeah in the way that you're doing it i think you have the right idea with the stamp of you going up beating that guy and then beating bival or uh, better be if whoever wins that fight i think right there you don't necessarily even need him yeah. anymore. Because at that point, that's where he has got to decide, do I have enough in the retirement plan? <laughs> or do I want to go get that 100, 200 million yeah. before I skate out? Yeah. Because he has, he, I mean, he's of course, he's had a lot of injuries and a lot of different things, but I think the fight needs to happen for on his sake. I'm yeah. looking at him. I think the fight needs to happen now rather than later. Yeah, yeah. but I think the problem is, the two tomorrow's like, what I'm afraid, because obviously I know this dude, like, first of all, coming to this place, I gotta go to the concierge. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. That's in that's in uh, f level fifty seven. Yeah. Can I get you a hot towel? Yeah. <laughs> so for, to me, it's it's like cool, but I, I think a magnitude a fight like that changes everything. I yeah. mean, obviously Canelo, we can talk about him all damn day, but I, I would like to go back, man, in your last fight against Demetrius Andre. Yeah. Andre, the dude is a two time Olympian. Amateur world, amateur world champion at that time was undefeated, mm -hmm. and you're just able to chop this dude yeah. up. Yeah, talk to me a little bit about that. I was just very excited for that fight. I mean, I feel like us, me, you, I mean, both you guys, you guys love the sport and you guys love training. Yeah, that's the fact. I know this guy. This guy trains super hard, and I know you train super hard too. So for me, when I got the call for that fight, I was like, man, I was just so excited. You know, I started training 13 weeks in advance. I, you know, I always train with my strength and conditioning guys. I put hundreds of miles and I'm running for my training camp, sparring for sparring partners, 13, 14, 15 rounds. So I was just, I was already ready, bro. Like I said, the better competition to get, the better I get and the more I could show to my fans. And I was just hundred percent ready. Since that fight with Caleb Plant, you know, that first pay-per-view fight, that just really changes everything. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, um, I'm like I said, I'm just ready for any challenge. And whoever people think that I'm gonna have trouble with, I'm not gonna have trouble because like I always say, the training camps, the fights are won in the training camps. Yeah. But and but in particularly breaking down Andre, like what was it that you saw? I was I studied him a lot. I knew that he was a lefty and he throw he throws a lot of throwaway punches. So I mean, me just knowing that, you know, I'm just waiting for the right time. The overhand right worked perfectly. You know, I worked on that punch a lot. You know what I mean? Just body shots, just breaking them down, just being who I am. You know what I mean? I feel like um, 
I'm really comfortable with being who I am. And, you know, I'm more elusive than what people give me credit for. My defense is better. It looks like I get hit, but I really don't get hit. I brush a lot of mama. And I'm like I said, I was just ready for that fight. I was ready for that challenge. Yeah. No, I, I remember watching that fight because uh, Demetrius Andres, he does actually train down here sometimes too. Yeah. Um, and I remember watching that fight. Yes, he was a smaller man coming up, but that goes to attest to just kind of some of the things that, that and basically what we're talking about now. You're in a spot to where you're in line for a promotion. Yeah. And this man is kind of, you know, standing in the way of you getting that promotion. And kind of the same way with with, uh, with Demetrius Andrade. Yeah. Because that was his biggest payday, mm -hmm. which, is, which is crazy to me. Yeah. But you gave him that shot. Yeah. And you gave him that ability to get that payday. Mm -hmm. And now it's kind of time to maybe someone, you know, return the favor, yeah. you know, give, give my man a shot. <laughs> but... It's, it's, it's something that's still evading. But yeah. the one thing that I want to ask you is just looking at the landscape of boxing right now, you know, because we are on pound for pound. <laughs> looking at everybody right now, how are you ranking the top five pound the for pound? Top five. So I have two of them um, that are fighting this weekend. It's Tyson Fury and Usyk. Those guys are... Oh, really? Yeah. You got them pound for pound. Whoever wins that fight is going to be on the pound for pound. Okay, top five. It's going to be top, the top five. five. All right, whoever loses, hey, hey, go slide hey, out. And, and by the way, I got Usyk on that. I think, be, I think it's going to be a good fight. Goes to the body, he's shorter. His angles, just the way he boxes yeah. his art. Olympic champ. Yeah. So I think, in a way, you definitely got to put Canelo up there. Um, put him at five? Just put him at for, six. For, for dodging? <laughs> <laughs> put him at nine. <laughs> Watch Canelo pop up on the other <laughs> You know, it's crazy. I like Canelo, but I, I don't like the fact that he's kind of doing the same thing that... Because they're, they're, all, they're all with Al Heyman. And what they do is they'll, they'll fucking stretch that dollar, dude, until it's until the piggy bank breaks. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But as of the, the pound for pound, Terrence so you Crawford... Got, yeah. You, okay, so you got Terrence Crawford on there. You've got winner of Usyk and, 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 uh, and Fury. Fury. In a way. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You got, you got uh, Canelo... And then and you've got Japanese, right there. In a way that the Japanese you. No, I think that was number no, four. That was number four. Yeah. So the fifth one is probably Gervonta. It's pretty Gervonta. Yeah. I think so. All right, now put them one through five. No, I don't want to do that. Yeah, come, <laughs> come on, come on. Come on. So you just put okay. The, okay, my opinion. I think number one is In a way. Number two is Usyk. Three is Gervonta Davis. Four is Canelo. And five. Who did I say? Crawford. Crawford. No, 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 no. Crawford is four. Canelo's five. Four. <laughs> Canelo's five. five. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, where do you put yourself in there? To be honest with you, but I'm going to be, be completely honest with you. I don't think I've done enough to reach the pound for pound. I think what's I'm I I'm a boxing fan at heart yeah. and I respect the titles. And until I become world champion again or unify some champions, I don't really be believe I deserve to be on that list. Obviously, I've had great fights and I'm the next one that's gonna be on that list. But I don't want anything given to me. I want to earn it. Oh, I like that. I like that. See, that's it's one thing that I like is is self awareness and you just being being humble with yourself, even though you know you the, you that dude because yeah. you gotta know you that dude. Yeah. Because you gotta have that confidence. No one steps in there and just going, Shh, I don't know if I might get him. Yeah. You know, you gotta know that you were that dude. Yeah. But it, it's something about it knowing that you were that dude, but with the with the humbleness yeah. behind it. That, and that's and this is the thing too. I hate when people do this to us. When people go, be humble. Yeah. Don't tell me to be humble. Yeah. I know what humble is. Yeah. You know, when people, I feel like it's when people tell you to be humble. Hey, be humble. Yeah. It's them almost kind of saying, don't get too big to where I yeah. can't. I don't have access to you. No, anymore. I can. I can. You, for you me, think, you think I'm humble. I, come on. What? You think I'm humble? <laughs> <laughs> for me, it's, it's just for me. It's just respecting the boxing, the ranks, the world titles, all the yes. great champions that came. Roberto Duran, Oscar De La Hoya, Mark Antonio Barrera, Roy Jones. You know, these guys, when they were on the pound for pound list, they were unified or, you know, I'd beat somebody that beat somebody or beat three, three or four or five somebody's. You know what I mean? So it's just a respect for the sport. And I think that it, it's not only about being humble, it's about making me hungrier and wanting to be on that list. So by the time I get there, I know I'm going to earn it for sure.
Yeah. I, I think with you, David, because I've known David. We used to spar, by the way, back when he was... Uh, 12, I'm 10, I'm, I'm 10 years older now. keep saying that we used to spar. Hell yeah. So I'm let's, a, just, let's, be, let's be honest su- here. Youngest super middleweight of all time. Yeah, he, we used to spar. Hey, I remember this dude cracked me with the right hand. Yeah, bro. He <laughs> was like fucking 20-something. I was then, 12. <laughs> <laughs> Got so him. Stop saying that. Got him. Wait, you were in your 20s? <laughs> in your 20s? He was 12? He was 21. I think he was 11, about to turn 12. Dude. Yo, you know how many like, times Henry does AA? Hey, hey, Spot with this 11 year old, like, what? He's 11. But, but, <laughs> David, <laughs> David. Like no, 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 no. Kid. But check this uh, out. He ain't beat me up. He ain't beat me up. But, but no, check no. this out. Check this out. With Don't David. Yeah. David, you spar with guys like Kelly Pavlik when you were 15? Yeah. 14, Golovkin. 15? Yeah, Golovkin at Golovkin. 15. I sparred all those guys, all the world champions. I think the first world champion I sparred was Kid Chocolate, uh, Peter Ooh, Quillen, yeah. Latif Coyote. Then I sparred... Uh, How old? What's the youngest you've... 14. Fuck. I saw... Let like, me tell you a, a crazy this is, story. This is, like, this is a grown-ass man. You sparred, dude, sparred like, Quillen, I'm Quillen I'm gonna show at, you. at 14? Damn. So... I had my brother when he went, so we're from Phoenix, Arizona, right? We grow up there. My brother, he, after he won Golden Gloves, he went to go train with Freddie Roach, my father. My parents were divorced. So I stayed with my mom and I was, I've always been a big kid at the time. I was 170. A year went by, a year and a half of no training. I already love eating. You know what I mean? One day I'm looking at myself in the mirror and bro, I was like 260. I didn't recognize myself. That's how scared I got. I looked at myself in the mirror. I'm like, holy shit. Like, I don't even know who the fuck I am. Like, I made the decision to myself. I'm like, either I do something about it or I keep going this way and I'm going to be obese and I'm going to be like my 600 pound life. You know what I mean? The people uh, you see. Yeah, he and that really scared busy. me. Yeah. So I said, fuck it. Let's go. You know what I mean? Um, I think I was 12. Taking two years off. So I still had... 10 years or nine years boxing. I went to wild card with my dad and we were training. And my dad always told everybody, cause my brother, he was talent, super talented. He was the next Oscar De La Hoya. But then my dad and my brother would tell everybody like, oh, wait, wait until you see David. That's really the talented one. I get there, I'm 260. He's like, this is a fucking guy that you said that was talented, that was better <laughs> than his brother. Yeah. And everybody would laugh at me. So I kind of use that as fuel for me. I, I definitely, that turned me into the boxer end because I would walk in, everybody would laugh at me. I would get in the ring and spar the biggest guy, the best, and I would put hands on him. And nobody, after that, nobody would say shit to me. Nobody laughed to me. They'd be like, oh, we see the reason why you think he's the next one. So from there, I sparred, uh, that's when I sparred Peter Quillen, Latif Coyote. Then I turned 15, I sparred Kelly Pavlik, and we had a great sparring session. And then we went to Big Bear. My brother was getting ready for a camp. And um, this was before Golovkin made his U.S. debut. So nobody knew who he was. Yeah. My dad asked Abel Sanchez, like, hey, do you guys have a, a somebody to spar my son, the other one? And I was 15 at the time. He's like, yeah, we have him. He just came in from Kazakhstan. And we look at him like, damn, this dude looks, this dude looks legit. Yeah. Like, fuck. And my dad's like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll spar him. Y'all see him hitting the bag? Fucking 15. 15 against Triple G. I'm like, shit. And this dude, before we got in the, in the ring to spar, he gave me the fucking coldest look I've ever seen in my life. Oh, yeah? Like, he really scared me, but I'm like, fuck it. And my dad believes I could go in there and hold my own. Let's get it. I don't care. We're having a great fucking sparring session, bro. I think it was the last round. We both throw a left hook to the body. We we'll both catch each other. I hear him go, Ugh, and obviously I went, Ugh, so I back, we backed up. And that was our first great sparring <laughs> session. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, bro. We hurt Damn. each other, and then we backed up, and we got each other's respect. And then I became his main sparring partner for fuck, I think like four or five camps. Oh shit! Yeah. So really, I had no idea. I, I, I knew, I knew, I knew you had Spartan, but not like that. So you, no. you kind of, you, you have a little, the, you know, the game plan is so experience with the guy that yeah. has been head to head with the guy. I feel like with him, he really gave me my style today because with him, everything I learned from him, I had to be. The max, my reflexes had to be this good. My speed had to be this good. My foot footwork had to be this good. Everything was on point with him. You can't make no mistakes. And that's what led me to be the fighter I am today. Because with him, I had to be on point. There were there were not sparring sessions. We were both trying to knock each other out. And we had some good fucking... He, I caught him, he caught me. Damn. So that's why I know that gave me so much confidence. Even to this day, too, I feel like I've seen the best fighters... In sparring, I know sparring is different, but sometimes when you have your way in the sparring session every single time, you know, you know, you know, you yeah. know what you could do. Yeah. So I was just 
And then big shout out to Golovkin, bro. I really look at him as a role model because he was the nicest guy, the humblest guy. But when that motherfucker went into the work, it was time to work. You chop shit down. Yeah. So I kind of looked at him and I'm like, you know what? That's kind of like the person I want to be. That's 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 somebody I look up to. Not only in the ring, but outside. The ring. All right, guys. Fantastic interview so far with our guy, Mr. David Benavidez. Uh, real quick, want to take a quick break and we want to give a big shout out to our partners at Underdog Fantasy. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports. Playing their pick'em game is as simple as selecting higher or lower on player stats like significant strikes and takedowns. Underdog has one of the biggest offerings in the MMA game and you can win up to 100 times your money. They also have picks for every other major sports like NBA and NHL playoff. Underdog is available in 30 plus states like California, Texas, Arizona, and of course, Florida. These are our picks for the UFC fight night this weekend. Cannoneer versus Imavov in Louisville, Kentucky. It's definitely going to be a great follow-up to UFC 302. So don't miss any of the action. Right now, new users to Underdog will receive up to $250 in bonus cash for their first deposit and a pick-up special when you use code P4P when you sign up. Support the show. Click the link down below in the description to get started. Thank you to Underdog Fantasy for supporting the show. Now let's get back to our interview with the one and only the Mexican monster, David Benavides. Well, let's talk about let's talk about just the relationship with your with your 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 dad, and of course your you know you guys are a fighting family. Yeah. Um, to where? How is that? To where your your dad's bragging about you, bragging about you, and you've been with mom. No. Yeah. And now you come you come over you. You know, you're a little thick, you know, <laughs> and, thick, and delicious. It's, it's t- talk, talk about the relationship with your dad to where, you know, how that goes with, okay, I'm deciding to change my life, dad. I know you can help get this on track. How is that relationship from then? And how is that relationship now? So I can start it now from now. My dad's, I mean, means everything to me. If it wasn't for my dad, I would not be in this position. And I give him credit a thousand percent because I've tried to quit a lot of times. He never let me. And um, so back then, bro, my dad, he was a savage, bro. He was just nothing but training. He was training. And if I don't train, I get disciplined. You know what I mean? So I was really scared of my dad for a long time. But, you know, that imp- that fear and that that fear implemented me to be trained as hard as I can. I was like a soldier. I was more scared of my dad if I didn't train than as opposed to if I would train four or five hours. So just being with my dad, he gave me such a great work ethic and you know, sometimes, bro, you need hard, you need to learn the hard way so you could really learn something, especially in combat sports. Yeah. I'd rather get slapped by my dad, my dad make me cry than me getting knocked out in the ring. And that's how I grew up. You know, my, if I didn't do something right, my dad slapped the shit out of me. Boom, boom, boom. But that really, I told my dad all the time, so like, you know what? Um, I appreciate you for all the spankings that you gave me when I was a little kid. You probably should have did it a little bit more. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But because that turned me into who I, who I am today. You know what I mean? I, it really made me get a work ethic that not a lot of kids had. And also, too, like, you got to think about it. I, at the time, I thought my dad hated me because I was always training. I only wanted to be a kid. But now I think about it, bro. If you sacrifice your childhood to something bigger than you, now I, I'm, I'm blessed with something that I could take care of my whole family with for the rest of my life. Yeah. And I could teach it to my kids. Yeah. So my dad, bro, like I'm saying, I have so much respect for him. I'm so happy that he yeah. he always had this vision for us. Yeah, his, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. At the time of being completely honest, I didn't believe it for myself, bro, because it just seems it seemed too far out there. Yeah, it seemed so hard. But I told myself that if I put a hundred percent into it, if I don't, if if I fell, fuck it. But if I really know for myself that I put a hundred hundred percent into it and I gave it my all, and if it's not for me, it's not for me. But now, looking now, everything is going pretty good for me. And I'm just very happy that my dad never gave up on me. And I never gave up on myself. Yeah, no. And not just that, Kamaru, but his dad. His dad, uh, you know, born in Mexico. You know, lived a lot of his teenage years in Mexico. And the, just the way that he found boxing, dude. I mean, he was a, he was a kid that went through famine. Like, he'll, he'll tell you that. It was to the point where, you know, like, he, was, he would fucking eat adobe, like actual dirt, to fucking get full. You know what I'm saying? From his growling stomach. Like, shit like that. 
And I've had a chance to witness and, and see the way how your dad was it, how he was with you yeah. guys. You know, we'd be in New York and he'd be out there with me. He's like, boom, he'd call. He's like, hey, get David, drop him off at 19th Avenue. Make sure he goes all the way to the gym. And let me know how long it takes him to get there. <laughs> I'm like, fuck, My dad used to dude. drop me off at the fucking freeways and make me run the dude, way. He was just like, and it was just like every day consistent. You're yeah. talking about it. I didn't give a fuck. At what, okay, at what point? Because it comes that time. To where you're like, hey. You've had enough. Hey. It came probably when I was like 18. I mean, um, now my dad knows, you know, we've had a lot of, you know, with father, son, you had yeah. a lot of like, you know, turmoil. But now my dad knows like, you know, I'm a man now. I like to do things my own way. As long as I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do, my dad gives me the respect and lets me do anything I want to do. But don't get it twisted. We have to work. We have to work as hard as we can. We have to run, strength and conditioning. And since I never really had a problem with training, you know, um, Everything is good. But before, when my dad, he didn't want to really let me off the hook. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we went through our little stages, like a little fights. But, you know, it's, it's normal for every father and son. I think now that my dad, you know, I'm a grown man. And, you know, I, I really put, I don't, I'm not going to let him down ever. Him or my family down. And he, he has trusted me. So he lets me do my camp however I want to do. And yeah, yeah. that's how it is. Yeah. And I've just become my own man. And, and I think in particularly now, like I could see he's he's a little different. I don't know. Yeah. I'm going to train with him tonight. <laughs> yeah, he was a savage. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? With age, you know? That's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mellow with age. But now, David, obviously you have your wife. Yeah. You have your, your, your kid, Anthony. Like how much is how much has your life changed? And how much do you view the world now? And particularly the way you were raised and now. Yeah. And how are you as a father now? Yeah. So to be honest with you, bro, first of all, for everything, you just have to be extremely grateful for everything. I feel like if you're grateful for anything, for everything that's happened to you, even the good and the bad, God will continue to bless you. You know what I mean? And right now, I just try to live in complete happiness. You know, I'm happy with everything, training with my son. You know, I he's going to be the next world champion. And I'm putting it in his head now. I'm telling him, I'm in Spanish, like, Papi, tu vas a ser el campeón del futuro. Like, you're going to be the world champion of the future. And he's like, All right. when, when Henry was outside right now, I'm like, hey, show him some combinations. And just like that, yeah, he jumps he in the character. Like, so, yeah. <laughs> he does a noise yeah. and shit. <laughs> Doing his little head movement. Yeah. You know what I mean? and he's only three years old, you know what I mean? So I'm just, I feel like our family, we're a family of boxers. This is never going to change. You know, that's something I want to hold with our family, our Benavides name. I think for generations, it's going to be known for boxing. And that's what I want to pass down to my kids and hopefully my grandkids when that time comes. And your brother. And my brother. Your, your, your older brother. Yeah. Was that was the, obviously the, the top dog for mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. And at what point did it, did it get to where it was like, oh, David, David's. Yeah. So it got to that point. He, so my brother, he, we went through a lot of stuff, bro. Um, you know, he was always dealing with injuries and he would yeah. mess up his hands and then you'd take him out for a year, another year or so. And then he had ended up getting shot in his leg and that kind of like really messed him up. You know what I mean? Um, and then two, I think it's just from him training so long, he had been, he had like almost 300 amateur fights. Yeah. And he, for, it, it, it was working a lot. It was kind of like a love, kind of like a love hate relationship yeah. with him. You know what I'm saying? Like he, he had it like that, but so talented. And then on. you could just imagine like, you know, you have all this shit happen to you, bro. And then he got shot. And then, you know what I mean? Just, now he's training more, you know, he's, he's getting into fights. He just had a great fight with Charlo. You know, it was a tough fight. A lot of people think, thought that, you know, it was going to be that Charlo was going to win easy, but my brother gave him a hell of a fight. And he has an upcoming fight, right? Um, He's training right now. He has no upcoming fight, but you know what I mean? I'm just, for my brother too, I give a, 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 a lot, I give a big shout out to him, a lot of respect to him because my brother's the only reason I started boxing. I always wanted to be like my brother, you know what I mean? And my brother's the one that started everything. He, put the foot, uh, open the doors for me. And, um, you know, I just always want to make my family proud, my brother proud. And I just, with him, I don't think I would have been the person I am today. Without, without him, I wouldn't have been the person I am today. Yeah. And is he, is he here as well? Is no, he he's in, Phoenix? he's in Seattle. Seattle. In Seattle. Yeah. See what, so you've moved now, if you've moved from Phoenix to Seattle, yeah. where you were, how long were you in Seattle? So I was there for five years, but I actually, when I, I moved out of Phoenix when I was like 15, really? then went back to 17 and then I went to, no, actually we went, I was in Phoenix 13, went to California for like four years, came back to Phoenix, then went to, uh, I went to Oregon, then I went to Las Vegas, then to Seattle, and now I'm here in Miami. 
on here. Yeah. Damn, and David, it, you're you've gone through a hell of a freaking ride, man. But yeah. I do gotta ask you, dude, because I'm starting to get hungry. What's that donut? What's that donut on your neck? Dude? So this is like, I can't really explain it right now, but this is like a sacred geometry pattern, and then it's mixed. It's called a torus, yeah. and then it's like a wrapped in copper. So this is like for like more metaphysical, more yeah. spiritual stuff. Yeah. I can't really explain it, you know, because I'm not. I don't know it 100. You have you have you been dabbling a little bit with uh, psychedelics? I've been, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I no, I no, no, you're not. No, 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 I haven't. I, I no. can just I can just tell you that stuff is that stuff is good, man. Yeah, it, it'll just it'll just expand the horizon of whatever the hell you're thinking. It'll give you a whole nother. So there was this one thinking. thing I did try. It's called blue lotus flower. It comes from the Egyptians. You can make that in tea, and then you go like in meditations. It takes you really deep into meditation. Really? I'm a big meditator. I pray a lot, and uh, I love sacred geometry. I like the old ancient history, like the Egyptian history. What 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 do you mean by uh, uh, sacred, sacred geometry? geometry? They're like patterns. There's they're patterns Is that like like off of uh, uh, um. Doctor Strange, you know. So how like, the at, lady so was? like, when you look at Ooh, stuff, I'm, when you I'm look at, you. when you look at stuff at the molecular level, yeah. like through a uh, microscope, there's patterns there and everything. There's a pattern called the flower of life, which is yeah. this. It's actually in our back. If you look, I forget what spot, but in the back, you look at it. It's there. Yeah. And these that's are crazy. like this is stuff from like ancient Egyptian times. And, um, that's, and that's and when you see when you, with the thing you just showed me right now. So this is how it looks. It's like a flower. So all these are basically circles, but they intertwine and they make a flower. It's some really deep stuff, bro. I be, I can't explain it to you 100% because I don't want to I don't want to get something wrong and you know what I mean. Yeah. No, but that if you get into it, get into yeah. sacred geometry, numerology, astrology, yeah. all that stuff Numer is really Numer interesting. Really, where all that dude, stuff really, is really interesting. No way. It's because like you think about it, bro. I, I sometimes I think about stuff like I feel like. So t t talk to me a little bit about numerology. I'm, I'm kind of curious. I, I, I don't want to explain it because I don't want to get stuff wrong. Yeah. It's 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 a uh, it's deep, and bro. I was, yeah, listen, I was listening. I was listening. I was listening to and a guy. That's, that's important. Mm -hmm. That was talking about numerology, and he's a guy that kids have named their kids after him. It's not like he's not like starting a cult or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But p people that have had like a certain amount of. Or the wife wasn't able to get pregnant, dude. Mm -hmm. And he's able to say, all right, man, you, when's your birthday? He's able to just come up with this whole thing as, hey, if you guys do it on this day, you guys take the test on yeah. this day, and I promise you will be pregnant. So there's certain days, like lucky days, like seven, nine. It's just, it gets really deep, bro. I wish I could explain it to you more, but I really can't. I've been trying to do my own research. So before I try to explain it to other people, yeah. I'm trying to figure it out first. You yeah. dabble into that, Kush? But it's cool, I mean, bro. It's, it's not so much that I dabble into it. It's, it's kind of like, it's kind of when we had the question of, I, I've been asked this, I've had this discussion a lot of times when they're like, oh, do you think there's anything out there? Is there aliens? And I'm just like, for me to sit here and think that, okay, we're just this species on this one planet, in this solar system, in this galaxy, and there's many of galaxies. First of all, we can't even get to that next planet or the next one. How can I sit here and say, and especially like Dr. Strange, I've seen that and it freaked me out because, you know, that my connection to that and, and wanting to open my mind and all of these things, it's all part of this spiritual realm to where I feel like you have to have when you, because you becoming pound for pound, you become a champion. That's, that exists in your head first. That, that kind of lives in your head a little bit first and yeah. nobody knows it. No, nope. Everyone's like, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people probably laughed and said, oh, this this thick kid, oh, he ain't gonna do nothing. He can't be that. He can't do this. Yeah. He can't do that. But you believe it in your head, and then you turn that into reality. Yeah. And so, so your spiritual connection to whatever you believe in, that's something that's very, very powerful and very, very real. And I think I am very spiritual when it comes to that. Yeah. And I can see that you are you're you are very spiritual as well. Yeah. Because and, and you, yeah, right now you're just boxing, but I think you have a bright future. You can do a lot of different things. Yeah, thank you. You know, you speak you speak very, very well. To where we see that with a lot of boxers who don't get out, you know, at mm -hmm. the right time, to where they kind of have trouble with that later on. Yeah, you know, you speak well, you, you're, you're, you know, no homo, you're a good looking dude. <laughs> Can't say that anymore. Pause. <laughs> or, 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 no Diddy. I don't know what they say. I don't know what the cool kids are saying now. But but you know, you 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 have. I think you have a bright future to do many many things, but not just the sport of boxing. Yeah. But right now. It's hard to deny that it is your time yeah. in the sport of boxing, yeah. and I and I think you're taking it very, very well, and I think you're going to be 
a hell of a champion. By the time you're done with your body of work, I think we're going to look back and say, oh, yeah, he was special. Yeah. So I just wanted to say something else on the spiritual side. So I, the thing I want to tell people, too, is some good advice. You know, we're all put here to be human beings at the end of the day. You should treat people how you would want to get treated. Percent. I treat everybody I meet, bro. If I, you know, if the vibe is right, I treat him like a brother. You know what I mean? This guy's been my brother. You seem like a really cool dude. So I feel like we're going to have that relationship too. But if you just live by the universal rules, just being a good person, helping out others when you can. And also, you know, just doing the right thing. You know, just being the best version of yourself you could be. I feel like that helps you, you know, gain good energy, good karma yeah. from the universe. So for me, you know, I, I train as hard as I can. You know, but I also pray, I pray to God every day and I tell him, you know, just help me be the best version of myself I could be. Help me reach my divine self. And when you put things in God's hands, bro, you, I mean, you see miracles get created. Miracles get put in front of you, bro. There's been stuff that's happened to me and I'm just like, I don't understand how it happens. You know what I mean? But it happens in my favor and I feel like it's because I've been as a person, I treat people and I really think the universe is watching and everything when you need that miracle to happen, if everything has been in play and you've been acting good with the, you've been in line with the universe, the universe is going to bless you back. Yeah, no, I agree for sure. Henry, are you, I know you with the psychedelics now. So <laughs> you... No, I, I like it, dude. I think if you ever decide to do that, David, and I know, you know, uncle Mike, uh, Mike Tyson, uh, oh, this guy. <laughs> get, <laughs> game, rolling around in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which we're so supposed to do with Dela Oil. Yeah. Dude, but... Dilla oh, always yeah. been punky now. He's been bitching out yeah. lately. But no, I, I you know, think like, so. It, look it, it, I do want to do that, when, but I feel like I want to do it when I'm done with my career. I don't. Sorry. I think I even heard Wilder said that. Oh, they took the killer instinct away from me. Really? The one his last fight when he fought Joseph mm. Parker. Yeah. Hey, but that's, it's, it's different for everybody. That's that's what I'm. Yeah, yeah you, don't, you don't want to get rid of that. Or or yeah, I mean, fuck, I don't. Yeah. yeah <laughs> it, it's just it's just different, dude. Like it, it'll it'll. It probably speaks to people different. Yeah. Like Mike, Mike is different. Like for me, it was different. Mm -hmm. I think everything that you're talking about with the numerology, uh, you know, everything that we've we've spoken about today, but it'll really just, you know, bring out that biggest insecurity that you probably have or that you probably don't know you have, and how yeah. you're able to, maybe if there's bags that you feel like you gotta forgive somebody, like you're able to just let shit go. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm not here to start a call. I'm just saying. I'm just curious because. Fuck, dude. I've known you since you were a kid, dude. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to feel bad about all the people I beat up. I'm going to have to call them like, brother. I ain't mean to do that to you, brother. I'm sorry, man. I'm but, before you, a, you, but before we go, dude. Now, I'm going to send you that extra, I'm send you that extra but, bread. Now. Hey, dude, but before we go, dude, I do want to bring somebody here. I want to bring Jose Benavides Sr. Yale, papa. Yale, papi. Yeah, like I said, no, thank you so much, guys, for uh, bringing me in. Um, Really appreciate it. You know, this is a very special moment, you know, here looking at the beach there and all these buildings, man. It's a dream come true, actually. You know, I never in my dreams would imagine that David would get this high. I would, don't get me wrong, I always believed in him and I knew he could do big things. But all this to me is like super incredible, unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, I think it's always crazy when things start to come to fruition because... And, and and as a father myself, um, my daughter told me a couple of years ago that she wanted to play tennis and that she wanted to be, you know, champion and, and, <laughs> and be like Serena and Venus. And and of course, and I, I would say that to her, okay, how many titles are you gonna win? And I'm sure like you were doing with him, oh, you're gonna be world champion. You're gonna be world champion. And at that point, you might not necessarily see it. You're like, ah, oh, I can't do that. That's impossible. You're thinking in your head, ah, oh, I can't get there. I can't get there. But yeah, by you planting that seed, you know, I think it's always surreal to when you sit and you start to look out and you're like, oh, yo, I was saying it then, I was saying it, but damn, I didn't think this was going to be real. I didn't think it was going to come true. And I think right now you guys are on the cusp of, of pulling up, every each one of y'all pulling up in the, in the red, yellow, blue Lamborghini or the Rolls Royce and y'all, David, you good? You good? Yeah, I'm good, pops. I think you guys are on the cusp of that. So it, I just want to say, obviously, you know, uh, first of all, thank you for even guiding him and leading him to the point now to where we can enjoy and be entertained by everything that he is doing right now, because I do truly believe he's on the cusp of that. And I mean, as you can attest, 
What yeah, no, for sure, man. You know, right now with this interview, it makes it so special to be here with Henry. You know, to be honest with you, I never really said this before to nobody. Right now, you know, having Henry or I don't know, it's just timing and all that, you know. The only thing I remember him, you know, being little, having like the toughest training in life, you know, since it was was born. He had no childhood. And then, you know, what I remember now, you know, his red, swe red sweater, big, <laughs> you know, to me, all those things do. come to me right now, you know, yeah. all the sacrifices and he had to go through hell, to be honest with you, you know, yeah, uh, he's uh, a monster. I, yeah. I made a monster, you know, H Jose, how much like, obviously, because I was there, you know, I was just <laughs> telling him the story when we're in New York and you'd be like, uh, you know, you call your brother, you call somebody at the, at the gym and you'd be like, hey, man. Drop off, drop off, drop, drop these dudes off and make sure they get to the gym. <laughs> like you got to run to the gym before you actually start practice. When, when, when did you feel like, all right, man, me as a father, not because as we know, in, in, in boxing, Sugar Shea Mosley and his father, they bumped heads, they, they split. A lot of, you hear it in boxing quite a bit. When did you kind of start to allow, because it seems like to me that you've allowed kind of Junior now and kind of David like become like one of their own. Like when, when did you feel like you had to make that transition? Cause you did it just as first, first of all, you're not going to thank all these people for going through all that. So I cannot go through that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I got a lot of respect for, um, uh, Danny Garcia's dad, uh, the ghost Guerrero, Sugar Shane Mosley. And I know exactly what happened with all of them. Teofimo Lopez. Now, you know, all these guys, you know, I really study what they did, you know, you know, they were too hard on their kids, you know? So I had to do something different. I had to let David, I, and we just talked about like about a week too, you know? I, I'm happy, man, you know, that you're taking over, man. You know, I've been doing this all this time, you know? Taking care of all the securities, the tickets, the flights, and, and, and all that, and the training, and, 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 and the, 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 the people that you want around. I want you to start feeling comfortable who you want, you know? And that, I feel that he's ready to do that step, you know? And these guys, the other guys, I'm not saying that they did it, but they had to do something wrong, you know? I think they never let go of, to me, he's still my kid, bro. He's still, ah, uh, you know, I want to, he's going to fall. I want to, I want to get him up, you know? <laughs> I, I, everything, you know? I'm always, yeah. but I have to relax. Yeah. I have to let him make his mistakes. And from that, you know, and he's made a lot of mistakes, but now. No, I haven't. <laughs> so now I think that was a blessing in disguise. Yeah. So he could get better. So, you know, and he's going to still make a lot of fucking mistakes. I'm there with him. Yeah, I don't, but I don't care. See, mistakes are just kind of like the, the actions that don't go the way you want necessarily. Yeah, just missing the but it's, but it's learning. They're the best experience that teaches you. Okay. I went left this time. I. Right. Go right next time. I wanted to show you guys yeah. something. This was me. This was my first interview. This was when I was like. You, you oh, yeah. <laughs> red sweater? <laughs> that red sweater? That's around the time that. Uh, that's how I remember. <laughs> Watch. I'm, uh, is it, they're going to show me full body right now. <laughs> was, was, that for, was that Junior's debut? That was the second pro fight. Okay. So it's even just like surreal, just like me thinking about being in my brother's uh, back rooms for his fight. Bro, it's been a wild experience. It's been a wild ride, but like I'm very happy with everything. I would never change anything. Everything's the way everything happened. Even the bad times are perfect. You know what I mean? So You know, for me, man, I lived with a lot of guilt for a long time. Finally, I cry. I let it go. You know, it still hits me sometimes, you know, but thank God little by little is going yeah. because they had no childhood, man. I always treat them like warriors animals you know monsters you know yeah see that's i want to i want to <laughs> speak a little bit about that is is it's it's now as, as a father's understanding of where where that that balance is is because part of what you did because you kind of kept them you know in a certain way okay you know they didn't have too much of that to where now they are above the rest of you know, I guess normal. They're not normal. You're not normal. You're in the 0.1%, you know, to where they're in that 0.1%. But at the same time, let's say we flip that and we give 
a, 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 a childhood, do you get to that 0.1%? You know, so, but you're in a place now of enlightenment to where you can kind of see and say, okay, maybe I could have been a little bit more, more of balance. But like we said, experience is the best teacher. Now you know how to pour into him. Well, he has a little one coming up. Yeah. Now you know how to tell him, hey, son, let him be a son. Let him be a little kid right now. You know, let him, let him play a little bit more. Not, you know, now I'm not going to do like you, you run, run your ass to the gym, you know? Yeah. Okay, let him, you know what? You know what? You know what? Drive him to the gym. You know what? Nah, you know what? You know what? I, 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 to be honest with you, I felt very guilty. I was like, fuck, man. But when they did it, I felt comfortable. I felt, fuck, yeah, good. It's just, that's what it is, too. I wouldn't change nothing at all. I wouldn't change nothing. I wouldn't even, if I could go back in time, it would make my childhood even harder, to be honest with you. Because it really brought me to where I'm at now. Okay, but now you got a junior. You got a little one coming up. Yeah. Are you going to run through that same cycle? No. You got- <laughs> no, 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 no. And that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Like the Serena sisters, you know, they yeah. went through a lot. Michael Jackson, Selena, all yeah, these people went through a lot, exactly. bro. But, they, they, but yeah. and that's the thing, though, you have to understand. Let's. And that's what one day I want to <laughs> get them all down to where I have to ask them this exact same question. Do you change that? Do you sacrifice that? You don't. Their greatness. Do you sacrifice that for the childhood? Because you're a child for a certain, just a short period of time. But what you accomplish, you have to live with for the rest of your life. Yeah. So what do you sacrifice? Do you change that? I will not change anything, like I said. You know, my kids. You know, I, I, I have the pattern. I have the. I have the. What's it called? The, a little, the, the a little blueprint. Bit easier, but I'm like, yeah, I, yeah, I have yeah. the blueprint. You know, so yeah. now it worked. You know, in the process, it kind of like. It worked, but you know what that. to take out and what not to take out. Now you know. Okay, maybe I don't make him run to the. Maybe I drive him to the gym, but I don't make him run all the way to the gym, right? So now you can kind of say, okay, I got the blueprint. I would you know, still do it. You know, still- that, that's what I'm saying. You know, I would still do it because at the end of the day, I, I, I look at it this way, right? You love your kids so much because you went through hard times. You know, you want to give them everything. You don't want to suffer. How are they going to appreciate if they don't suffer? You know, in my opinion, that's what yeah. it is. You know, I have my son, you know, and, you know, thank God I made a lot of money through David. I might a lot. Thank God I'm sad. I'm, I can retire tomorrow and live a happy life because I invested in good things, you know? I have good properties and all that. And then these guys, I can buy whatever they want. But you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let them work for it, you know? Because then I, I will make it easier for them. That's my thinking, you know? So I want them to struggle. I have my daughter, you know? I know she's struggling, you know? But I, I go there and help her a little bit. But you know what? I tell her, you know what? You did this because for you. You didn't do it because David or me or nobody. You're doing it through you. You're yeah. working hard and you're yeah. making those sacrifices and she's getting better and she's getting more mature. You know, if I could, it's easy for me to just buy things that she needs. Yeah. But really, I'm, I'm, I will be messing, yeah. messing her up. There's an understanding you know? of yeah. that value, yeah. the yeah. values you can, you can and, and, and implementing those. So, yeah. I mean, I think you did a, obviously, we think you did a phenomenal job because right now, look where we're sitting, you know talking to you getting to yeah. know you a little bit better and you know we we look and we got almost a, three, a 180 view you out here say, looking at the water would you like so, a hot towel <laughs> no. so uh, you've, you've done, done a fantastic, fantastic job. job i mean david you are you, you know you obviously you know these belts speak for themselves of what you've done and you are truly on the cusp of of really getting that as they like to call in in, in, in in UFC, red panty night. Yeah. You are truly on the cusp of that. So, yeah, thank you, you know, my man, I, I, we're watching you. We've been watching you. We're going to continue to watch you. We love everything you've done. And we we're you know, my eyes are glued to the TV waiting to see what you're going to do next. And so we want to say thank you for letting us in your home. Thank you for giving us your time. Yeah. You know, I am the Nigerian nightmare, Kamaru Usman. Henry Cejudo, a.k.a. Triple C. And I just want to, I, I, I want to tell every, our uh, Henry and Kumar, you know, it's, a, it's been a pleasure sitting with two living legends, yeah, UFC so. Hall of Famers, you know, I've yeah. been followed this guy and I've followed you for a long, long time yeah. too. So thank, thank you so you much for this. You know what guys, you know what, before we leave, I want to, I want to get one more sound by <laughs> your dad. What message do you got for Canelo Alvarez? You know, I mean, and I want you to look into that damn no, camera. No, you know, right a there. lot of people say, you know, like you were saying, he's not scared. He has to be scared because he will lose everything he's worked so hard for it. To pass it over to David, if he's not scared, tell me what it is. 
200 million dollars and he'll fight him tomorrow so i think he is scared you know the mexican monster is there he's scared of monsters he's coming it's coming <laughs> what about you dave you got you got any last message for for canelo dude man, he know he knows what it is man i just feel like if he's really confident in his skills let's put his skills to the test and let's let the whole world watch it and the winner take all damn well you heard it here david jose benavidez pleasure thank you and we are out Woo!